My name is Tong. Uh, I'm working as a research scientist as uh, trusting social. Um, so, um, before going to my uh, talk, I just want to have a quick introduction about uh, trusting social and what we are, what we are working on. Um, trusting social is a um, company who um, who um, deliver data science uh, technology for financial inclusion. So um, we do credit scoring using alternative sources of data so that we can uh, assess credit worthiness to the whole population. Um, and we have offices around um, Asian countries, um, like uh, the headquarters in Singapore, um, office in Ho Chi Minh City, in a few in, in India, and research team is in Ho Chi Minh City and Melbourne. So I am based in Melbourne. Um, so here's the outline of my talk today. Um, I will divide the talk into two parts. The first part is the motivation of um, the company. Um, let's start with the grade scoring problem um, and grade scoring using alternative sources of data um, and the economic scale of our solution. In the second part, um, I will focus more in the technical part um, with the um, brief introduction of prediction modeling and um, the challenges that we face so far. Um, when we deliver machine learning and data science to this um, problem and uh, how we work through that and um, what we are working on at the moment as well. So first, um, I just, because the, I prepared the talk for a general audience, so I um, just want to have a quick introduction of credit scoring. Uh, some of you may have known this um, topic, but um, basically, in finance, lending is a main business of the, the institutions. So, but before we, the, the banks or the financial company can um, provide a loan, they need a way to estimate the level of um, risk associated to the consumers. Uh, so by definition, credit scoring is the process to evaluate the risk of a consumer both of defaulting on financial application. Um, so, to give a bit of context, uh, at the moment, FICO is the biggest credit score provider in finance. And if you work in banking and finance, you, ha you must have known FICO. So, um, for, as a statistic, every year about 10 billion uh, FICO scores were sold. Um, and um, in average, Every day, there are 27 million um, credit scores sold by FICO. And in, put in the context of the U.S., 90% um, of the lending decision was made used by um, FICO scores. Um, so, for, to, to, to have a risk, um, credit scoring model, this is how they work. So, at the at the prediction as a observation time and normally this is the time that people apply for the loan we want to predict whether they will default or not uh, in the future and what they need is um, the history of the person um, and in fecal um, um, solution they need the credit attributes about the person for example uh, I will show in the detail later and then using those attributes, they, they will predict whether in the future um, the, that particular consumer is going to default or not. So what do they need? What they need is basically the financial behavior of the consumers. Um, some examples are the payment history or the amount owed or the length of the credit history. Um, some other things like the new credit um, or the types of that credit that the consumer use and some other public records that they can obtain um, publicly from public um, records. So 
giving giving given that uh, information, can you can you give me a, a problem with Fico? What is the problem that Fico may face? For example, put in the context of India, what is the problem that uh, they are facing now? Lack of data, but in particular, what kind of data they lack? Any other answer? So, in the U.S., most of the people uh, will have the bank history. They're going to have bank account and they have long history. Most of them, of course, some of them may, may have never um, taken the loan. But when it put in the context of India, for example, most of the population haven't got any record in the banks and they haven't never taken a loan. So how can they actually assess the great worthiness of the consumers if they haven't got any, any great history? So that is the reason why we, we are here. That's, um, that uh, we will, so this is the issue with um, FICO credit scoring. Because they cannot assess the credit worthiness of the consumers who haven't got any banking or credit history. And the, worldwide, there are about 1.5 billion adults that haven't got any credit history. So basically, FICO score will keep those consumers out of the finance, financial loop. If they don't do not have a credit history, they, they, they don't have a credit worthiness, and the bank not going to give them the loan, or they give them the loan with a very, very high interest rate. So basically, they, they are excluded from finance, financial assets. So what is the solution? If we face that problem, can you think of a, a solution? What can we do? Any, anyone has an answer for this? Any answer? Yep, we have to use alternative, alternative sources of data, right? Because if you say that you need credit history to give a credit worthiness, then we can't solve that problem in developing countries like India or Vietnam or Indonesia. That's why we have to use alternative sources of data. But what are they? What are the sources that we can use? Can you give an example? So some company uh, some uh, company they use um, social media data, but that that direction is basically very very hard now because, for example, Facebook closed um, the APIs in I think in 2014. So we cannot basically we can't grow all the data from Facebook anymore, especially after the Cambridge um, scandal. So. We at Trust in Social, we we partner with um, we partner with the telco data with the telco um, to use the telco data and also combine with other sources of data as well to um, assess the credit worthiness. But the main principle here is that traditionally we use financial behavior of the consumers to assess their worthiness, we are going the other way around. We use their behavior overall to assess their greatest worthiness. The reason is the behavioral data is much more richer than financial behavior. So financial behavior, you only get, have their credit history and how they pay the loans and things like that. But behavioral data is capturing much more about the person. Um, we can continue about this topic um, um, offline. 
So the effect of using these alternative sources of data, we have a few um, effects. So basically, we assess the great worthiness based on um, behavioral data. And we have al already proof proved that our scores is better than the other um, scores using financial behavior. We can cover the whole population, and especially we, we cover the unbanked population. That's why in our, um, our slogan of the company is that we provide financial inclusion for all. And we also can scale the business uh, much more than other solutions. So to give an example, in the previous uh, slide, some previous slide, I showed that the FICO score can only assess the great worthiness of the, the, the consumers who already have the great uh, um, history. But we, because we can give the great score for the whole population, so we can, we can provide better fine grand customer customized product um, to the consumer. So for example, if we, if we can assess the great worthiness uh, with a, a good accuracy, we, we can confidently provide a loan to the consumer with a lower interest rate. And um, <clears throat> so in the second part of my talk, I would like to um, focus a bit more in the technical detail. And as a research scientist in machine learning, my talk will be favored in machine learning perspective and how like the challenges that we um, the challenges that we face so far in the journey. So because the talk was prepared for the general audience, so I just want to have a very quick overview of um, prediction modeling. So in prediction modeling, what we want to do is we want to predict an outcome for some example. For, so in this scenario, in our problems, our goal is to predict whether a consumer is a defaulter or not and which what um, level of confidence. So what we need, um, for, so this is the, the whole process of training a machine learning uh, a prediction model. So what we need is a set of training examples and of course we have to extract the features from that set. We need to fit that into a, a supervised model of like a logistic regression of random forest. Um, those models are gonna require uh, some parameters and at the first point we need to initialize the values for those parameters. And then the model is going to give some prediction for the sample that we have in the training, in the training set. Based on the, prediction, um, based on the prediction of the models and the labels, the graph truth that we already have, the learner is going to improve the parameters to provide a better um, prediction. And we're going to go into this process until we satisfy with the performance of the model. And after we train the model, we test them by a, a test set where we haven't seen them during the training uh, phase. And we use the parameters that we already trained to do the prediction and then use, compare the prediction with the labels um, to evaluate the performance of the model. So going through this process, what do we need to make this prediction model work? We need, the first is the data. Of course, the data with the labels, right? And then from the data, we need to extract the features. We need the labels and we need the models. And of course, we need computational facility to uh, run this process. But each of these elements comes with its own challenge and I will go through a few challenges that we face so far. First is how we're going to obtain 
uh, the label data. The second thing is especially put in the context of um, credit scoring, we face a uh, class imbalance problem. <coughs> the third challenge is a complex and noisy data. The fourth challenge is the curse of dimensionality. The fifth one is the huge volume of data. The sixth is the reliability of the model. And uh, last one is conceptual. So I will go um, quickly through each of these challenges. So the first challenge is um, how to obtain uh, the label data. This is the most important part because this is necessary to build any machine learning model. Of course, I put in the context of prediction model. Um, and the golden rule here is garbage in, garbage out. So, so how we can obtain those data? We have to build partnerships with uh, different stakeholders, including the banks, the telcos, the fin financial institutions. Um, but it's not an easy part task and we have to spend a few years to actually come up with these partnerships. The second challenge is the imbalanced data. So the thing is, to give you an example, if we have a set of 10,000 loans, we have only maybe five to 600 loans that are default. So the rate of defaulter is very, very small compared to the whole number of labels that we have. So there is no actually model who can deal with this imbalance problem easily. So, and there is a very fundamental limit on what accuracy we can predict with this kind of labels and we have to accept that. So the lesson learned with this challenge is <clears throat> we have to be mindful of not only the, the data, the features and the labels, but we have to be mindful about the imbalance of the data. If we do not use a suitable um, measure, um, performance matrix, our model is going to be screwed up. And this is the second lesson is we should not use the machine learning models as a black box. <clears throat> we have to customize them to suit our, um, suit our needs. The third challenge that we faced was complex and noisy data. The data that we have are quite bad in the sense that there are a lot of missing values and a lot of duplicated and correlated columns uh, or sources of data. So to give an example, we have the data from the telcos. Um, we have the call and SMS transaction. We have the top up transaction um, or value added service. And most of these um, data sources are noisy and unstructured. So I want to emphasize again here is the golden rule here is garbage in, garbage out. Even though you have a very, very good machine learning models, for example, uh, actually boost a very, very powerful machine learning models. But if you do not process your data well, you don't have a clean feature set and a clean label set, your model is not going to work. So how did we deal with it? So first we have to rely on the data engineer team to do data cleansing. It's very, very, um, very heavy job for them. And then we need the data team to do the feature engineering. They need to understand the characteristic of the data to come up with a set of features that they can extract from the data. So, but this process also comes with its own problem. We can, we can generate up to maybe 10,000 features. But 
So with those large number of features, what, what are the problems that they may come up with? That is called the curse of dimensionality. So because we have a huge dimensionality and the high level of sparsity, um, some features may only like cover 10 or 15 percent of the population. So the level of sparsity is, is very, very high. But we cannot drop those features because we are not sure whether they can contribute to the models or not. And also because we extract them somehow like using statistical functions. So many of the features are strongly correlated to each other. And with that kind of data, the problem that we face is it's very, it's very difficult to train the machine learning models and it can be easily overfitting with our data set. It produces unstable models and it's difficult to scale. So it, for example, if you want to predict the rate score for example of 200 million consumers, how long your machine learning model is going to run for the just prediction phase only if you, feel, if you use 10,000 features. So what should we do with this, these problems? So first, in terms of infrastructure, we need to have the best system that we can have. From a big data engineering perspective, we, have, we should have the best solution that we can. But it still cannot solve the problem. So we have to come with machine learning solution. So we have to do feature -like selection. A lot of techniques that we can use feature -like selection. Or we can do semi-automatic feature engineering and um, or fully automatic feature engineering. Um, the fifth challenge that we face is scalability. So to give you the context of what, size, what kind of the data that we deal with, in, some tel in one of the telco that we have, um, we can cooperate with, they have 50 million subscribers and they produce a few terabytes of data a month and billions of records. But give, moving to bigger markets like Indonesia or India, a, sub, a telco can have up to maybe 250 million subscribers. So you can imagine how is the size of the data that we have to deal with. To be honest with you, I don't work in this field. So if you are interested in this topic, you can come to our booth and talk to our big data engineers. The sixth challenge that we face is reliability. So typical approach to evaluate machine learning models are you, we can use K4 cross validation. So from the training set, we split the data into um, training and valid set, and we do that for 10 different subsets of the, the data. Or we can even hold our test set. We don't touch them at all during the whole process of training, including the fine-tuning the parameters. But is it good enough in our situation? The thing is, we need to convince not only our team internally, but we have to convince our partners, the banks, the financial institutions, that our credit score is, is reliable. So we have to run intensive evaluation process with our partners to evaluate um, our performance. The, the seventh the, the seven challenge that we faced was concept drift because, because of many reasons. The world is dynamic and the behavior, especially in, in telco data, the way that we make the call or sending the message are different depending on many factors like the culture or background or the country or the demographic groups. Especially we face that um, very serious when we move to India. And the behavioral challenge uh, patterns also change over time because of many factors like seasonality um, or 
social or commercial events like you may have a, a festival uh, coming up or even it changed due to personal um, situation. So how we can con deal with uh, con this uh, concept? So we have to evaluate, um, anal analyze the bias and variance in the data and in the distribution of the, the, feature, the data. And th our experience is that if our concept is high, then we use a low variance model. Uh, and the other way around, if the concept is low, then we can use a, a low bias model. So to summarize my message here, there are a few lessons that we learned throughout this uh, whole process. That the real data is always complex and noisy. And the golden rule, even though I'm from machine learning um, background, but the golden rule always is garbage in, garbage out. So even though your machine learning model is very, very good, but if your data, your features, and your labels are not clean enough, then you won't, you won't have good result. So that's why data cleansing and feature engineering is, is very crucial um, in our journey. The third um, lesson is we should not use machine learning models as a black box because I'm working as a research scientist, but also sometimes I take part in the recruit recruitment part, uh, part. And I, I can see that a lot of people now put um, in their CV that they are data scientists. And they put a lot of keywords in the resume saying that they can do this and that. But we can figure out after maybe half an hour talk with them that they only use them like, let's say, import from scikit-learn and then import uh, and fit the data and, and train the models. But if we ask any further question, then they can't answer. If they can't answer those questions, then how can they fine tune the models? How can they modify if the data is not working well? If the model is not working well with, with that data? So the rule is we need someone who really know what is under the hood. And even though we, use, we still use um, open source library to save our time, but if we need, we still can jump in and modify the models. Um, that is the lesson that we, we learned heavily throughout, throughout um, our journey. And the evaluation, um, the, another lesson is that the evaluation should not be limited in the simple trend test split but we need to keep testing dynamically with the new data that we can, can have. And that is the, the reason is that the real data is, is highly dynamic. And the, the philosophy that we um, implement in Trusting Social is that we always hire the best person for the job who knows what they need to do. So with those challenges that we face, why Trust and Social works and can go through the journey. So we have different teams and I'm proud of the team members that we have that we, I can say that we have the best person for that particular job. For example, we have a business team who come up with the business problems that we have. Um, and the partnerships that we have with our partners. The data analytic team have a very deep understanding of the data and come up with the set of features um, that are working well with the models. The machine learning team is, can control and manage the advanced machine learning models and we are working on the cutting edge areas of machine learning community. The big data engineer team is very good in data governance and scalability. And finally, the software engineer team can deliver the high quality system and products. So to give you a bit of context of what we are working on now, I will um, go through a 
few um, a few directions that we are working at the moment in terms of uh, machine learning and deep learning. So we work on graph analytics because our data mainly like one of the important sources of data in our um, da uh, data that we have is the, the graph, the social graph, the contact graph between um, customers. Um, and we also work on representation learning um, and a few other topics of deep learning like attention and transformer network and deep generative models. We also work on transfer learning, how we can transfer the model from one domain to another domain. And we also work on computer vision and NLP. In terms of um, the products and problems that we solve, we solve a few problems in finance like risk assessments, fraud detection, face recognition and identi identification for um, uh, the know your customer purpose. And finally, we also working on chatbot and robot advisors. That also concludes my talk today. So if you are interested in, you can talk to me offline or you can send me an email. And this time for questions.